Okay, sir. Good evening to all. Uh, sir, today I am presenting a case. Uh, uh, he is a 81 year old gentleman, uh, a resident of Delhi, is a retired government employee by uh, a profession. He is a known hypertensive since 20 years on regular treatment. And he is a known case of ulcerative colitis E2 disease uh, since the last 15 years and in remission and compliant with his medications. He presented, uh, presented to us with chief complaints of loose tools since uh, 10 days. Uh, the history of present illness, uh, he is having loose tools since last 10 days, which are uh, insidious onset. Uh, the, these are uh, watery with no solid components, uh, Bristol stools uh, 7 and 10 to 12 stools per day with nocturnal frequency of 4 to 5 stools. Uh, these are small volume associated with mucus and blood streaks. And he is also complaints of low grade fever, uh, but there is no need of any medication for fever. Uh, uh, he is having urgency and tenismus, but there is no incontinence. These stools are not uh, foul smelling, not containing any worms or undigested food particles. Each stool is preceded by mild lower abdominal pain. Uh, he is uh, he's describing those We lost your sound. We have lost the connectivity, Dr. Goenka, just. All right. Is it from your end? Ah, Dr. Ashok, you are back. Yes, good. So just click on the slide show again. Yeah. Uh, he is not having any abdominal distinction. He is not complaining any vomiting. And uh, he is denied any lumps. And uh, there is no anorexia or weight loss or swelling of feet. And he is uh, not having any joint pains or skin lesions or eye symptoms or uh, jaundice. He denied antibiotic or NSAID use in the recent past, and there is no past history of uh, blood transfusions or exertional breathlessness, and there is no history of uh, suggestive of thrombotic events in the past. Uh, in the treatment history, he is on uh, calcium channel blocker for hypertension, uh, and he is on methylamine for uh, last 15 years, and he is in remission, and there is no uh, clear episode since last 15 years, and he was treated for pulmonary tuberculosis uh, 30 years ago. And he is not having any history of surgeries. He takes mixed diet and there is no addictions. And the family history, there is no significant family history. Not other family members are suffering from similar complaint. And uh, to summarize, he is an 81-year-old male, a known hypertensive and ulcerative colitis, E2 extend disease, on treatment and in remission till now since 15 years, now presented with acute flare. So can you, I mean, yes, sir. you have used the word, he is presented with acute flare. So what do you feel? Yes, sir, sir. Presented with flares, flares, there, is no, there is no like a chronic flare, sir. It's, uh, he presented with flare. See, they, uh, for 15 years, he did not have any episode. Of no, flare. sir. Since 15 years, he is in remission. Uh, initially, he, he continued to take uh, mesalamine for 15 years? Yes, sir. He continues to take mesalamine since 15 years. So, can I ask you, Ashok, one case that if you are starting this patient 15 years back, seeing this patient 15 years back, would you continue with 5 ASA drug or with you and, it, and at any stage think of changing to some other drug? Sir, uh, if he is in remission, he is not having any uh, symptoms. Uh, he is, uh, because mesalome, uh, 5 ASA, uh, in this patient, there is no side effects. There's, to compare with other drugs, these are the safer drugs. So, how do you uh, react to my asking you a question that between 5-ASA and switching to one of, one of the immunosuppressants like maybe azathioprine or methotrexate in a patient after obtaining remission, which of the two you think is a better option? Sir, and if uh, I can extend the question, see, we have, our purpose of this presentation, let me tell you, you'll be interrupted several times, but all three of us, but that's how the exam is conducted. The exam never goes in... You can't, I've told this earlier also. So 
So if I, you are given as a fresh case, will would you think of 5-ASA as the drug of choice for emission or will you think of any of the immunosuppressants? Mm -hmm. I think we lost connectivity of Dr. Ashok. Samarth, if you are there, you can answer this question. Samarth? Sure. Till the time. Sorry, sir. Ah. So both of you are there, are there together, huh? right? Yes. So the question was, if you had started seeing this patient right from the beginning, would you have continued uh, 5SA or switched over to something like azathioprine? Sir, uh, I like to continue uh, mesalamine, sir, to compare with uh, the five ASCs, uh, like immunomodulators, azathioprine or 6 uh, mercaptopurin. Uh, to compare with uh, five ASCs, there is a chance of uh, uh, lymphoproliferative disorders or uh, non-melanoma uh, skin cancers. To compare with those drugs, uh, five ASCs are safer. Okay, I agree. Now, if this, this patient would have had Crohn's disease, would your approach be different or the same? Whether in uh, Crohn's disease also you continue with 5-ASA or you think there's no role for Crohn's, in Crohn's disease of 5-ASA for maintenance of remission? <clears throat> Sir, uh, in Crohn's disease, to compare with 5-ASA, uh, better to be immunomodulators to continue remission. So That's right. <laughs> so in ulcerative colitis, nearly 30 to 40 percent patients will maintain their remission on 5-ASA only. Yes. yes. In okay. Crohn's disease, it is always better to be on immunomodulators, even if it is after the first episode. In ulcerative colitis, if the patient has steroid-dependent disease, then you, the first choice is to switch to immunomodulators. Uh, Ashok, what was the history? Uh, he has had only one episode uh, 15 years ago, and that was... Uh, yes, 15, years, 15 years ago, he had a uh, uh, blood stage Oh. blood stain stool sir uh, and then actually at the time he was not admitted then he underwent a sigmoidoscopy and diagnosed as ulcerative colitis and he started on uh, the as per the patient he started on some drugs which was tapered and stopped and the rest of the drug use are continued maybe he was started on steroids at the beginning and that was tapered and stopped and he was continued on mesalamine and then so he never had a second is asking you is that is it common for an ulcerative colitis natural history to have one episode and then remain in remission for 15 years and then have another flare. Is it common or it's not so common? It's not yeah. common, sir. And the so it can happen. There can be only one episode and it may subside and remain in remission, but usually it's a remitting and remission and exacerbating disease, but it's all right. No issues. Carry on. I think the best would be if you put your video off, your yes. transmission will be better. Because you are working on the low Wi Fi broad Allow me, allow Samarth. Sir, uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Samarth to allow to share the screen, sir? I can uh, present. Yes, yes, you can share the screen, Dr. Samarth. Carry on, carry on. Okay, sir. Sir, to analyze his symptoms, uh, he is having organic diarrhea because of uh, uh, blood in the stools and as uh, nocturnal in nature. And he's having large, bo large bowel type of diarrhea, which are uh, because of small volume in the blood streaks uh, with the rectal symptoms in form of uh, tenismus. And there is no features of malabsorption. And uh, he's an inflammatory type of diarrhea because blood in the stools. Uh, he's, uh, uh, my syndromic diagnosis is a large bowel inflammatory diarrhea. The known ulcerative qualities patient uh, with uh, presented with a large bowel inflammatory diarrhea. Sir, my possible differentials are uh, acute flare of ulcerative colitis and uh, infective diarrhea and carcinoma colon. Sir. So only only thing is that how definite was the uh, ulcerative colitis diagnosis made 15 years back? Are we totally justified in depending on patients telling you that he was diagnosed as ulcerative colitis? Could it be one acute self-limiting colitis and then now we have second episode, which can be anything? 
Agreed, sir. But patient uh, clearly stating he is having ulcerative colitis, which was uh, the drugs was started and tapered, which is suggest of steroids. And he is uh, clearly telling I am having a E2 extent of disease. They told him actually he is having E2 extent of disease. But 15 years back, records was not available. Okay. So if uh, the previous uh, history was not there, what would have would have been your di differential diagnosis? Sir, uh, with uh, acute diarrhea, 10 days of large bowel diarrhea, uh, I can put uh, the first uh, is a infective diarrhea, sir. Uh, infective diarrhea, like uh, it's a bacterial, it can be a salmonella, shigella, or uh, C. difficile. And uh, it can be due to any viral uh, CMV rotavirus because uh, 8 years uh, age. 8 year old person? Rotavirus, uh, sir, rotavirus is uncommon, sir. CMV. Rotavirus with blood? With, no, sir. Rotavirus even, mainly. Even, even C. difficile for that matter is very rare to have bloody diarrhea. Yes, sir. Less than 5% possibly would have bloody diarrhea. Mostly they are not non bloody diarrhea, but yes, uh, if, if it's C. difficile alone. Yes, so and rota, please don't even talk about rota. Okay. Okay. Eighty-one years, until there's an immunocompromised individual, yes, I sir. think rota is a disease of infancy. Yes, sir. And uh, eighty years, uh, it can still if it is not underlying ulcerative qualities, CA colon is a possibility. Sir. So can you Ashok tell me a few of the infective pathologies where the disease may not be very short and maybe of a prolonged nature? Which are the which of the uh, infective etiology can have uh, colitis going on for a couple of weeks? Uh, sir, uh, CMV. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ersinia and Tamiba, uh, amoebic colitis. Okay. What Ersinia, else? Ersinia, sir. Yes, correct. What else? Ersinia, you said. Talk, talk, talk about bacteria. Talk about bacteria. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And something else sir. which we see quite commonly. Uh, sir, uh, salmonella, sir. Salmonella usually is not very prolonged, but it's all right. Salmonella shigalas are usually not prolonged. But tuberculosis you can't forget. Okay, sir. Tuberculosis can have long, long. This is with uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar telling you that you just forget about the previous episodes. Then what are the possibilities you should think about? Possibly then all the elf, acute self-limiting colitis and tuberculosis will also come in the differential diagnosis. You agree, Dr. Piyush? Yes, sir. With the age of onset also, uh, Ashok, you should be cautious. He has a, if it is, if he's 81 now, then he has an onset at around 66, right? So 66 yes, is not a very common age for onset of <clears throat> ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis, yes, sir. And there's a question in chat box that uh, you had mentioned that sigmoidoscopy was done initially without full colonoscopy. So how can you say that it was E2 disease? Sir, actually after sigmoidoscopy, they're given a steroids and they have done a complete colonoscopy. And that's why the patient is clearly stating is having, they mentioned as E2 disease, but the patient don't know is what is E2 and what is E1. But clearly he's telling he's having E2 disease. So I think we should not give too much of importance to what the patient says and we do not have the histology and available, then I think we should keep our horizon wide, uh, thinking of all, all the possibilities, you know, who diagnosed, what was the level of diagnosis, all these will come into the question. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, in examination, he is a conscious, coherent, cooperative and comfortably sitting on bed. He's moderately built and moderately nourished. He's febrile. He's, uh, there is no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, uh, or edema or lymphadenopathy. His pulse is 86 per minute uh, in right hand, uh, radial pulse, which is regular. And BP is uh, 110 by 80 millimeter of mercury. His height is 170 centimeters and weight is 64 kg. His BMI is 22.1 kg per meter square. A mid -arm circumference is around 24 centimeters. And there is no signs of uh, any micronutrient deficiencies and there is no signs of any extra intestinal manifestations. Uh, a, a systemic examination uh, per abdomen. Uh, uh, abdomen is normal in shape and the umbilicus is inverted and the uh, skin overlying abdomen is normal. The all quadrants are moving with respiration. There is no visible lump or no engorged veins or no visible peristalsis or any visible pulsations. 
Uh, in the palpation, there is no palpable liver or spleen. Uh, in percussion, liver dullness was felt on fifth intercostal space. Uh, there is no free fluid, evidence of free fluid. Auscultation, there is no bruise heard over abdomen. Uh, Parietal examination, uh, on inspection, there is no skin tag, uh, though, uh, no perianal discharge, no fissure or fistula. Uh, anal tone was normal and his uh, rectum was empty. Uh, the enlarged prostate was palpable and uh, the finger was stained with uh, uh, blood. And other systemic examination was normal. Uh, the examination was not much contributory. Uh, uh, this is still the large bowel inflammatory diarrhea in, in underlying ulcerative colitis patient. My differentials were same. What all extra intestinal features did you look for specifically? Sir, uh, I had seen for uh, any uh, eye symptoms, uh, redness, or any skin lesions like uh, erythema nodosum or pyoderma, uh, pyoderma <coughs> and also any joint uh, swelling or uh, joint pain, any uh, oral cavity, any uh, after ulcers or stomatitis. And you talked about micronutrients. What did you look for micronutrients? Sir, micronutrients mainly the vitamin uh, vitamins uh, deficiency, sir. Uh, uh, stomatitis, uh, glossitis, and also skin lesions like dermatitis. Any hyperpigmentation. So, do you expect in a large bowel disease uh, no, all these vitamin deficiencies? No, sir. Mainly these are the main features in the small bowel diarrhea. Alright, carry on. Uh, so sir, uh, your differential diagnosis is not changed. Not but changed. Can you tell us about the uh, your second possibility you have kept is infective diarrhea. That means yeah. you are talking about infective diarrhea without ulcerative colitis. Sir, can be a possibility, sir. Uh, but in underlying uh, ulcerative colitis, there is a more chances for uh, as a CMV. So when you say acute flare of ulcerative colitis, you think it's a natural history of ulcerative colitis, or there also you are bringing infection as a as a factor? Sir, uh, actually, uh, it can be both, sir. Actually, the, uh, the natural course, there is a flares and also the most of the flares are uh, by the infections like CMV or CDPC. Let me ask you other way around. What proportion of patients with UC in an acute flare would be found to have uh, uh, infective etiology? There is some Indian data on this. Sir, around uh, 20 to 30 percent. Oh, too high. That is too high. It is very old paper. I mentioned to you once, Ashok. 1993, Dr. Goenka is one of the co-authors. PGI Chandigarh, Dr. Rakesh Kochar is the first author. Around 16 percent, sir. That was a thesis of one of the students. Right. And I mean, still that is one of the best this thing which you will find. I mean, this is such an important topic, but there hasn't been much information on this issue specifically that answers the question specifically and 16 percent is the figure in that paper right yes sir okay so here infection would be as one of the precipitating factors in ulcerative colitis so yes. that is what you want to say that is it it yes sir carry on Carry on with sir, the investigations. Uh, sir, investigations, uh, there is a, uh, anemia. Hemoglobin was 10.8 gram per deciliter. And he is having uh, CRP elevated CRPs to, uh, 205. And his CMV PCR was negative. And his uh, stool C cell toxin is positive, sir. And uh, leukocytosis, uh, total count is around 14,000. Sir, we also have to take questions from the chat box. So, can I ask? So one question yes. is: Can uh, uh, can we keep a possibility of Crohn's colitis or SRUS? Ashok, sir, uh, SRUS. I mean, patient uh, the patient will have most of the constipation, not diarrhea. But in the watery diarrhea, when patient is having constipation, it is spurious diarrhea can present. But uh, patient will prominently will tell about the constipation in SRUS. Okay, if I say it's uh, spurious diarrhea with stercoral ulcers. Spurious diarrhea with stercoral ulcers. Sir, again, the constipation 
will have in the history. But it can be a spurious diarrhea. There may be a lump of stool in the rectum, which is causing a stercoral ulcer and uh, maybe even piles which can bleed. All these are, uh, I mean, my point of uh, telling you is that keep your possibilities wide rather than just thinking of one or two possibilities. Okay. SUR, I agree that this is not the usual manifestation of solitary rectal ulcer, mm -hmm. though it's very common in our country somehow, but it's not the usual presentation. So, all right, so you have a diagnosis now. How do we proceed? Yes, sir, sir uh, he underwent uh, sigmoidoscopy, uh, which showed uh, uh, pseudomembranes, pseudomembranes, and uh, uh, the biopsy was done from the sigmoid in colon. Addition, in addition to pseudomembranes, there are changes of ulcerative colitis, aren't there? So yes, sir. There is a loss of vascularity and uh, erythema. Is there any granularity you can see? Yes, sir. Actually, see. So endoscopically, how would you grade this? Sir, uh, the granularity, loss of vascularity will come in uh, UCS uh, grading of, uh, sir, uh, endoscopic grading of three, sir, loss of vascularity. Which grading classification is this? Sir, my score. UCIS is entirely different, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, which is being practiced in a real life scenario? Is it Mayo, which is more commonly practiced, or UCIS? Sir, uh, UCIS is actually uh, mentioned, sir, but uh, most people are using Mayo score, which is uh, somewhat simpler. Okay. All right, carry on. Yes, sir. He underwent uh, sigmoidoscopic uh, colonoscopic, uh, colonoscopic biopsy, what sir. Was the extent uh, which... of examination done? What was the extent of examination done? Was it only sigmoidoscopy or was full and colonoscopy? Sir, uh, that time underwent only sigmoidoscopy, sir. And whatever area was seen was involved? Yes, sir. Uh, seen up to descending colon. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, this is the low, uh, uh, low power view of the colonic biopsy, sir, which showed uh, actually the creeps. Uh, with uh, volcano-like eruptions with uh, ulcers. This this is the one and this is the one, sir. Which is suggest of pseudomembranes. And the CMV on this biopsy is negative. Then our diagnosis was mild to moderate C, uh, CDI because uh, he is not in any uh, features of uh, uh, shock like uh, and also his uh, creatinine is less than 1.5 and uh, Total count is less than 15,000. What is the commonly used grading for Clostridium difficile? If this is mild to moderate, what are the others? Sir, uh, mild to moderate and severe, sir, normally they will divide into fulminant or not fulminant. In fulminant, in, uh, in, ful uh, in non-fulminant, they will divide into mild to moderate and severe, sir. The grading of IDSA. So I think when you mention diagnosis, Ashok, you again you are forgetting ulcerative colitis. Yeah. Yes, sir. The diagnosis has to be complete. So it is ulcerative colitis, and the on the top of ulcerative colitis, you are thinking there is mild to moderate CDS. Mild to moderate CDS. And is the ulcerative colitis active now? Sir, uh, the very difficult to tell about. Uh, it is. Uh, is it's a flare or only uh, because of uh, symptoms are only uh, due to flare or uh, because of CDF cell. When, when we had seen the CDI, we would start the treatment of CD, uh, Clostridium difficile and patient is not improving, then we think about the flare. But clinically, it's very difficult to differentiate between both. But and how did this CDI occur without any, uh, there was no history of antibiotic or anything like that? But there is no history of any antibiotic use, sir, prior to this episode. So how common is uh, C. difficile without uh, this, uh, without antibiotic use and all? Sir, without antibiotic use, there is um, actually a community acquired Clostridium difficile, which is more common in uh, uh, underlying IBD patients. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Without what Ashish is asking, that has got meaning. Post antibiotic use would be in community acquired. In IBD patients, you can have C. difficile even without antibiotic use. Without antibiotic use. Yeah. Uh, then he was, sir, even, then he was treated with vancomycin uh, for ten days. 
but uh, his story was not ended. His story was continued. Uh, he was symptom free uh, for four weeks. And again, he had symptoms uh, like abdominal pain uh, associated with watery diarrhea. And he was uh, initially episode, he was treated with vancomycin, uh, which is for 10 days, 125 mg QID. In the next episode, he's given a vancomycin pulse, uh, which is uh, 125 mg QID for a uh, uh, 14 days and BD for uh, uh, two weeks and OD for one week. And after that, uh, every second or third day for two more weeks. Then again, he was symptom free for six weeks. Again, he had uh, similar symptoms and which was treated with uh, again vancomycin with uh, rifaximine chaser. Vancomycin was given for uh, 10 days and followed by rifaximine for 20 days. Then again, uh, he was symptom free for six weeks again and he came with symptoms of uh, same and found to have CDFC positive. And what are the options we left now? So I have one question that was C. difficile clearing documented at any time? Yes, sir. Every is time it... C. difficile, which is resistant, or you think it's a recurrent C. difficile? Sir, actually, uh, his symptoms are uh, in between. He was symptom free around six weeks and four weeks, sir. No, no, no. no. The uh. question is that whether it was resistant, refractory C. difficile, it had never gone. So have you documented that C. difficile was negative? Yes, sir. That has got a different meaning. Yes, sir. CD still documented as negative. That is what the question is. So yes, each sir. time it was a recurrence and in between the uh, reports. He's had symptom free, uh, symptom free episodes and he's also CD still negative in between. It's not a refractory, sir. I mean, look, it's not a uh, refractory. So there's a there's a question on the chat box as to is the ABD, IBD associated CDI any different from the community acquired CDI? Yes, sir. Definitely it is different. I'm coming to uh, that uh, presentation. All right. Yes. Move ahead. Okay. Now, what are the available options for this patient and why is having recurrent CDI? What, what are the available options for him? Already we given a vancomycin. Uh, we'll give vancomycin again or fedaxomycin, which is not available in India. And his option of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation and we will uh, plan to give any antibodies like uh, bezlotoximab. Now, actually, uh, we give we offered a FMT uh, and we screened, uh, we uh, detailed about the family about FMT and what the procedure and why we will do. And uh, we screened one of the, his family's members, uh, his son-in-law. Uh, we screened him as a donor and he underwent one session of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. Uh, he is symptom free since last two months. And his C. difficile also documented as negative. So it's just eight weeks, but you had gap of about four and six weeks in between also. Yes. So yes. Do you think it's too early for us to be happy? <laughs> Definitely, sir. We will we have to follow up him because he had this many. Uh, so you are, uh, you are mentioned that the uh, relative was screened. Uh, do we discuss that in this next presentation, uh, Dr. Piyush and Dr. Ashish? Can yes, we ask him? How was the relative screened? Now you can tell Ashok how, what are the screening protocols? Sir, actually screening protocol, uh, uh, we will follow, actually we'll see all the infective, sir. First we'll see the patient uh, systemic examination. And also after that we'll screen first his, uh, 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 in, for infections like hepatitis A, E, and also uh, C. difficile, and also actually other uh, amoebiasis and all, uh, other uh, infective causes. And also we'll see hepatitis B and hepatitis C and HIV also, sir. And we'll uh, uh, do the routine stool examination. Then, uh, is there any, if you are a, if you have multiple choices of a donor, yes, sir. Are there any selective criteria where the success is more likely? Related, unrelated donor, male versus female. Sir, actually, uh, in the trials, actually, uh, so many trials, they followed a super donor and we, they have done a microbiota uh, of uh, every uh, all patients and they had selected a super donor and they have done. But here, actually, uh, to do a uh, microbiota of a patient, is uh, not possible here, sir. Actually, not approved labs are there. That's why we are uh, screening the relative donor only, sir. But you haven't answered the question, which is better? Sir, uh, if we have to choose, uh, better to choose non-related donor, which is uh, 
who is not uh, residing in the same environment because we, we want to change the uh, microbiota of this patient. So there are advantage and disadvantage both. Yes, sir. Okay. Preferably if you get an unrelated donor, that unrelated is unrelated donor is better. Okay. Because acceptance and that's actually we are offering the relatives. Right. Move ahead. Move ahead. What else do you know? Sir, uh, I'm briefing about the CD uh, CD cell in IBD. Uh, it's different uh, to compare with uh, other people and the CDI uh, mainly IBD is a risk factor because of uh, chronic inflammation and dysbiosis and others are antibiotic exposure and old age and uh, recent hospitalization and uh, any on immunosuppression. And uh, uh, if uh, actually the IBD, uh, the CDI uh, incidence is increasing in IBD to compare with from 2000 to 2005, it is increasing to 16%, maybe because of uh, more uh, recognizing of CDI also. And uh, uh, there will be atypical presentation to compare with a normal. Uh, what is the atypical features of uh, C. difficile in uh, complicating IBD? May develop without antimicrobial use and it can present in younger age and more often community onset. And look, uh, there is a uh, uh, lack of atypical, uh, lack of typical colonic uh, colonoscopy features and simple colonization without infection also is more common in IBD patients. And symptom presence or resolution is a uh, unreliable marker for the, uh, in IBD patients. And uh, if see the ulcerative qualities uh, with C. difficile, 9% of ulcerative qualities patients had concomitant uh, C. difficile infection and association of uh, C. difficile with uh, ulcerative qualities because of chronic inflammation and dysbiosis in ulcerative qualities. CMV infection at higher risk uh, is at higher risk for co-infection with uh, uh, C. difficile and it impacts increased colectomy rates and escalation of IBD therapy and there is a, a higher readmission rates and hospital stay and mortality. The ongoing steroids and immunomodulators are biologicals will not increase the risk for uh, C. difficile infection. Uh, Indian data, uh, this is from 2017 uh, from PJ Chandigarh, uh, IBD and C. difficile infection. Uh, they, it is a retrospective study. They studied around 721 IBD patients. They found 16% uh, had C. difficile infection. They found duration of diarrhea is also longer uh, to compare with non-IBD patients uh, in IBD patients. How will uh, differentiate between uh, flare of uh, ulcerative colitis and C. difficile infection? The clinically, we, ca we cannot uh, separate between both. And the uh, C, uh, C. difficile infection, diarrhea will be more prominent to compare with the flare, and the blood is less common, and fever and abdominal pain uh, can be associated features. But in the flare, uh, bloody diarrhea is more common to compare with C. difficile. Uh, and also, a C. difficile can lead to flare up of underlying ulcerative colitis or IBD. Uh, this is a nutshell how the difference between the IBD uh, patients and non-IBD patients with C. difficile. If patient with IBD patients, they can present in the younger age and the antibiotic exposure then is no, uh, with less likely and more often community onset. And, uh, and they have a per, uh, persistent dysbiosis. That's why uh, they have higher chances of recurrent uh, CDA to compare with non-IBD uh, patients. In IBD patients, the antibiotic exposure and also old age more often hospital acquired uh, C. difficile and they have a lack of ongoing antibiotic exposure. If they stop the uh, C. difficile, uh, other than C. difficile antibiotics after C. difficile infection, there is a very uh, lesser chances of recurrence. What is uh, recurrent CDA? The defined as recurrence of, uh, there is a relapse or recurrence of CDA symptoms within eight weeks after, on, uh, after the onset of a previous episode. The risk factors for recurrent CDI, uh, mainly the advan advanced age uh, and antibiotic use after CDI diagnosis and severe underlying disease or renal insufficiency and the previous history of clostridium difficile and the previous CDI severity, depending on the previous CDI uh, severity and prolonged hospital stay and hypervirulent strains of uh, C. difficile. And ad adverse outcomes of uh, C. difficile in IBD patients. Uh, it can cause subsequent IBD flares, more likely to be uh, failed medical therapy and more frequently to escalate IBD therapy. And uh, there is a chance of CDA recurrence, higher surgery rates, and higher mortality in these patients. Uh, nutshell of uh, management of uh, C. difficile in IBD. Actually, if it is an initial episode, it's a fulminant or non-fulminant. If it is non-fulminant, we'll give vancomycin. It is a fulminant uh, in features of uh, hypotension or megacolon. We have to give vancomycin plus metronidazole. 
and uh, if if it is ongoing uh, if if it is ongoing symptoms if patient is not improved after 3 to 4 days of treatment we have to consider to escalate the immunosuppression uh, maybe the it can be underlying flare also if patient is having a recurrence if it is a first recurrence that means second episode we can give vancomycin pulse or vancomycin uh, vancomycin pulse if if patient is having more than one recurrence that means uh, from the third episode we can choose uh, vancomycin uh, uh, plus rifaximin chaser and also we can give an option if uh, patient is not improving we can give a fecal microbiota transplantation This patient is having more than one recurrence and he already given vancomycin uh, and vancomycin chaser or uh, rifaximin chaser also. That's why we offered an FMT. There's a question, Ashok. Uh, how many times can you repeat FMT if the patient did not respond? Sir, uh, actually, uh, we we given one session for this patient and actually in the uh, CD facility, uh, one or two sessions are enough depending on the trials. There is no clear cut answer to that. You can yes, spend, most of the people have used one single session. One session. Yes, sir. And uh, next one is why is having a recurrent uh, CDFC infection? Uh, what are the difference between uh, UC in the normal onset, like uh, between uh, 15 to 30 years, and uh, uh, is an elderly patient? Elderly. Uh, the 25 to 35 percent of IBD uh, are aged more than or equal to 60 years. About 15 percent of them are diagnosed during the old age, and 20 percent diagnosed at younger age and transition into the older age. Many are misdiagnosed initially uh, in ulcerative colitis as a infectious colitis and the diverticular and a ischemic colitis. And difference they have a difference in presentation, course, therapeutic strategies, and complications. Elderly patients are rarely included at trials, but that's why actually the Therapeutic uh, management also difficult to compare with normal patients. In elderly patients, the less severe disease course uh, and despite severe initial attacks, the left sided colitis is more common to compare with uh, normal course of ulcerative which is a proctitis is most common. And elderly patients have less features of uh, less features as abdominal pain and less extra intestinal manifestation, but they have prone for more intestinal complications and more infections. And there is a limitation for steroid and biological use due to comorbidities and the surgery performed more frequently to compare with a normal uh, 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 IBD uh, ulcerative qualities patients. Uh, IBD in elderly is different because uh, the most of the time it is it has a misdiagnosed and they have underlying comorbidities, the less trials uh, in the uh, elderly patients. And uh, there is limitations to use biological patient uh, biologicals, and they have more prone for more infections. And uh, the problem with the treatment adherence because they have more uh, on the other therapies like polypharmacy, the adherence also difficult for these patients. And uh, why is having recurrent uh, CDA? He is underlying IBD, and he is having advanced age, and his history of C difficile itself. Is that your last slide? No, sir. Because we have another presentation also. Yes, sir. The take home points are uh, uh, every IBD flare patient should be tested for uh, C. difficile and uh, screen for recurrent C. difficile uh, infection if diarrhea or colitis persist. And treat C. difficile infection in IBD with vancomycin instead of metronidazole and escalation of immunosuppression after three to four days if ongoing colitis after treatment of C. difficile. Consider fecal microbiota transplantation for recurrent CDA infection. Every IBT flare uh, patient should be tested for CDFC. Yes, sir. Yeah. Apart from CDFC, all other infections should be tested given the fact yes, that many of these might be due to infectious causes. So that is very important to understand. Uh, should we move to the next presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have only 20 minutes left. Okay. 
sir are my slides uh, visible at present yes yeah, yeah. make it full screen yeah yes sir. yes sir uh, sir i am dr samarth uh, good evening to everyone i will be discussing on the role of uh, fecal microbiota transplant in recurrent c difficile diarrhea before i go on to the fmt and c difficile i'll just share few slides on uh, the human uh, the gut microbiota it is like just Uh, so, uh, in the human gut, as we transcend down from the stomach to the colon, uh, the population of the microorganism uh, tremendously increases. It is around 10 to 100 in stomach and it increases up to a trillion in colon. And uh, the uh, process of colonization starts soon after the birth or during the peripartum period and it, the majority of it completes around one year of age. And uh, usually it gets complete almost 100% by three years of age. And there are a few determinants that decide it, uh, that the mode of delivery, whether it is a vaginal delivery or a C-section, the environmental exposure and the antimicrobial therapies in the initial years of life. Uh, so the gut microbiota has four major phyla. They are Firmicutes, Actinobacter, Bacteroides and Proteobacter. Uh, the Firmicutes is basically a phylum of gram-positive bacteria, which has two large classes, Bacilli and Clostridia. Then there is Actinobacter, there is Bacteroidea, which are having a specific clinical significance that most anaerobic infections are from this class and they are associated with higher mortality of around 19 to 20 percent. Then there is Proteobacteria phylum, which is are the gram-negative bacteria of pathogenic genera, example like Escheria, Salmonella, Vibrio, etc. So in the gut microbiome. 90% is constituted by Firmicutes and Bacteroides, while only 10% is constituted by Actinobacter and Proteobacter. So I'll just uh, sh uh, share a few definitions, uh, and these are three microbiota, microbiome, and metagenomics. So what is microbiota? Microbiota is the population of a microorganism that is residing in a specific environment. Like for the human gut, it is termed as human micro the gut microbiota. The microbiome is the entire collection of the genomic material of a specific microorganism that is known as microbiome. And the typical the field that is that deals with the study and the research part of this microbiome is termed as metagenomics. So now coming on to the uh, C. difficile, which was earlier known as Clostridium difficile, and now the nomenclature has been changed Clostridium difficile in 2016, and the name, the change in the name in the prefix has been slight only to because it has a widely accepted abbreviation as C. diff or C. difficile. So there has been recently the smaller change has been done. And why the suffix difficile is because it is a fastidious organism which is difficult to grow or culture, hence the term difficile. It is a gram positive obligate anaerobe, spore forming non motile bacteria, and it was first identified as an antibiotic associated diarrhea in 1978. As Ashok has already discussed, the majority of them are uh, two thirds of them are the nosocomial, while the community acquired are in only one third of the cases, but this is on the rise nowadays. The in, what is the prevalence of C. difficile in India? There has been a systemic review of 31 studies, which was published in 2020, and it has shown the prevalence range from 3.4 to 18 percent, and it had a typical regional differentiation. And then there were few anecdotal reports from different uh, institutes, which varied from 3.4 to 18 percent. So, how common is the recurrence of C. difficile? It is indeed common. It is like 20 to 25 percent of patient has a recurrence. After the primary C. difficile infection, 40% usually after the first recurrence and more than 50% after the second or subsequent recurrence. So the risk of recurrence increases after every subsequent episode. Now Ashok has already discussed again about the grades of severity. It is mild to moderate, severe disease and the fulminant disease. For the severe disease, we need two factors, WBC more than 15,000, creatinine more than 1.5. For the fulminant disease, any of the four if present along with the severe disease, hypertension, shock, eyelids, or megacolon, then it will be termed as a fulminant disease. Now, this has also been uh, has also been mentioned by Ashok that what is recurrent C. difficile and what is refractory C. difficile. So the rec recurrent C. difficile is when CDR recurs within eight weeks after the onset of previous episode. But meanwhile, it is provided that symptoms from the previous episode got resolved. While in the refractory C. difficile, the CDI was unresponsive to the antimicrobial treatment. 
namely it is by the persistence of the diarrhea with the C toxin, CD toxin positive. Now, what are the risk factors for CDI recurrence? Advancing age, history of recurrence of CDI, as we have mentioned, continued administration of the other antibiotic, severity of the underlying primary C deficit, antacid use, a defective humoral immune response, and the disease coload. The red highlighted part indicates that what all were present at the patient that we have discussed. He was an 81 year old male. He had the history of recurrence of CDI and he has a disease colon with underlying ulcerative colitis. So now I'll just throw uh, like next two minutes, I'll just uh, show the landmark articles which define the treatment of C. difficile. So this was uh, published by Fred Ezra group in 2005 and it has established that vancomycin is superior to metronidazole for treating severe C. difficile. Then uh, there was an entry of fidaxomycin, which, was, which happened in 2011, published in NEGM. And that, this has simply shown that the effectiveness of fidaxomycin is as same as vancomycin, but the recurrence rate was low in the fidaxomycin group. It was 15%, while in the vancomycin group, it was 25%. The and the recurrence rate was associated with non-NAP strain. NAP strain was the North American pulse field or ribo type 0 to 7 strain, which has which was responsible for the epidemics in the early 2000 in Canada and US. However, the availability of uh, fidoxomycin is still a challenge in India. Now, the these are the ACG guidelines statement and Ashok has covered all, already most of it. Right? It is the for the non severe CDI vancomycin, oral vancomycin 125 mg four times for 10 days or fidoxomycin 200 mg twice daily for 10 days. Or if these of both of these drugs are not very much or not frequently available, then metronidazole can be tried if the patient's condition is non-severe. While for the severe CDI, metronidazole is absolutely out of the guidelines. Now, for the uh, how do we uh, manage the fulminant CDI? The medical therapy. There is a surgical part which will not be covered. The, for the medical management, we have to increase the dose of the vancomycin, like from 150 mg to 500 mg of oral vancomycin every six hourly. Earlier we were giving 125 mg uh, four hour, uh, four times a day. Now we are giving 500 mg six times a day, along with the uh, parental met uh, metronidazole, IV metronidazole of 500 mg eight hourly, the regular dose. And if the patient has ileus, the, the addition of vancomycin anemia will be helpful. So the treatment of first recurrence, tapered or the pulse dose vancomycin for the patient experiencing the first recurrence or the pedoxomycin can also be given. And how is to be given the pulse dose? Ashok has already mentioned about it. Now, before we jump on to the second recurrence, there are the new addition in the armamentorium of the C. difficile that needs special mention first is rifaximin. So the rifaximin, there was a rapid trial, the rifaximin chaser or the rifaximin follow on treatment and which leads to the reduced recurrence of around by around 50%. So this has been included in the guidelines. The another drug is deslotoxumab. So there were two IV monoclonal and antibodies, ecto, ectotoxumab and deslotoxumab for C. difficile toxin A and B, as we know that C. difficile toxin B is more virulent. So the bezlotoxumab is, has been approved as an adjunctive therapy. This was, these were the modified trials. So they have been more, uh, the, like the bezlotoxumab administration was associated with less chances of recurrence. And it was administered as 10 mg per kg, a single infusion dose, along with the standard of care regimen. So for the treatment of second CD, uh, or second or subsequent CDI recurrence, these are the recent guidelines, it, recent IDSA guidelines, which got published in September, 2021. That either you can give vancomycin in the tapered dose, again, in the second recurrence, you can give pedoxomycin, you can give vancomycin plus rifaximin chaser. Now here enters the FMT. In the earlier guidelines, it was used to be in the third recurrence. Now it is in the FMT is in the second recurrence. As well as for the adjunctive therapy, means you have to give the standard of care. Along with that, as an adjunctive therapy, you can give bezlotoxumab. Now FMT, this has been taken from an NEGM to 2013 editorial. It has been mentioned here as 1958 in Denver, there was a first procedure of, of the fecal microbiota transplantation was done. And in the abstract of that paper, it was mentioned that it was to reestablish the balance of nature, which was lost due to the antibiotic treatment. So why for more than 50 years, uh, the FMT has not got, gained a lot of popularity because it has aesthetically unappealing and the no nomenclature itself, which includes the word fecal microbiota transplant, maybe probably the word fecus 
can be removed. It is logistically challenging and there's lack of efficacy data and RCT from different indication. It was published in 2013, so it was mentioned in that paper. After that, we have got a lot of systemic reviews and randomized trial, which have a, which has a proven that FMT is a uh, FMT for recurrent C deficit. And this has been clearly mentioned in every guideline nowadays that FMT for recurrent C deficit infection is approved and should be done. So this was the first trial again the for the uh, from the uh, Dutch group when node group from for the duodenal infusion here they have in, uh, used the nasal duodenal tube uh, for the FMT and they have shown that the uh, cure rate without relapse was higher in the FMT group. Uh, after that there was a uh, systemic review which was approved and which has highlighted few important points about FMT that it has a cure rate of around 92 percent. There was a significant difference, uh, significant difference between the administration of FMT, lower GI route or the colonoscopic route is preferred over the upper GI route. There was no difference. Either you give a fresh or frozen FMT, both are equally efficacious. And administrating consecutive courses of FMT following failure of FMT resulted in incremental effect. And there were no serious adverse effect that was seen. Or if the seed official is primary and if it is fulminant, can we do FMT? Yes, it is approved again. It is in the, and as per the ACG guideline, you can go ahead with the FMT for the, if the disease is fulminant at the onset. It means it had either any of the four factors, hypertension, shock, megacolon, or ileus. Although the doing FMT in such condition will be difficult. So we have discussed already this single or multiple infusion, the multiple infusion of pseudomembrane driven FMT protocol is better for the cure rate and to decrease the relapse rate. However, the pseudomembrane driven FMT protocol will be difficult in IBD patient as they already have less tendency to have a pseudomembrane. So we have discussed for the recurrent seed epistle. Do we approve uh, or is it been approved? FMT has been approved for primary seed epistle or not? So for this, there had been two trials and both of them have clearly mentioned that FMT is not superior in symptom resolution than the drugs. So it is unlikely that FMT is needed as a first line management of C deficit. Fresh versus frozen, we have discussed that both are equally efficacious and it was published in JAMA 2016 that both are equally efficacious. Now this is, I'll just ponder one minute on this trial. It has been recently published in NEGM in January 2022, SCR 109. An oral microbiome therapy for recurrent C deficit. SCR probably stands from the uh, the serine therapeutics that have formed this molecule, and this is developed in the background that till now the drugs that we have of C deficit, none of them address that uh, the disrupted microbiome, and none of the drug make an attempt to restore the disruption of the microbiome in the intestine. So the SCR 109 is a microbiome therapeutic composed of purified firmicute spore for the treatment of recurrent C. difficile. And it has the patient inclusion criteria with three or more episode of C. difficile recurrence. And the aim was to establish SCR 109 as compared with placebo, that it reduces the risk of C. difficile infection and recurrence up to eight weeks. And they have been successful in proving the same. In the SCR 109 group, the recurrence was uh, at the end of eight weeks was 12% comparative to 40% in the placebo group. So SCR was superior to placebo in reducing the risk of recurrent infection. CDI management and IBD, Ashok has already discussed in detail about the same. I would just highlight few points that it recommended that C deficit testing in patient with IBD presenting with an acute flare, it should be done. Immunosuppressive IBD therapy should not be held during NTCDI therapy in the setting of disease flare and escalation of the therapy may be considered if there is no symptomatic improvement with the treatment of CDI. FMT should be considered for recurrent CDI in patient with IBD. It is safe and efficacious with marginal risk of IBD flare. And frequency of pseudomembrane formation is less, hence pseudomembrane-driven FMTs are not recommended. This is uh, the question that has been uh, put up that what all tests, if a donor, if we select a donor, which is preferably should be an unrelated donor, and what all particular tests that we should get done. Although it varies from institute to institute, but as per the guidelines, the routine tests, including RFT, LFT, that should be done. In, uh, the serum, the markers of sepsis, serum procal, blood culture, and all should be done. The stool routine, stool test include the stool routine microscopy, stool for C. difficile, stool for parasite, these, and stool culture. These four tests should be done. While the infective, the viral infected hepatitis A to E, all 
should be done along with amoebic serology should be done in such patients. Adverse effects, this is the last slide. The adverse effect of the C. difficile, although there had not been very serious events, there had been anecdotal reports of uh, enteropathogenic uh, E. coli transmission that had led to death of two patients in the prior case reports. However, the transmission of enteric pathogen still remains a challenge with the FMT with, with, despite the proper donor screening and the IBD flares. Although how common is the IBD flare? That is, there had been 29 to 30 studies on it, and it varies from 4% to around 15%. And what are the potential long-term side effects? It's they say it's hepatitis C or HIV, but it's not very commonly seen, and we need more time to see the potential long-term side effects on the of the FMT. That's all. Thank you. Very good presentation. Um, there, see, the only only thing is that how many times can you do it? Is there any endpoint and what frequency can you repeat it? Yes, sir. So there had been the trials on it, and they have shown that we can do the repeated sequential FMT. They all have said that it should be pseudo membrane driven. However, the question arises when the pseudo membrane is not very commonly seen. Like we uh, face this issue in the IBD patient, so. In IBD also, there had been one study in the IBD patients. If at all we have to do repeated sessions, then it is also on, it is not on any marker. It is just on the simple resolution of the symptoms. If the symptoms have been resolved, then in that study, they have done up to three to four sessions, four sessions specifically. So that is a very important question. At what interval? Uh, sir, it is, it is done at around every two weeks. In the succession, when they have seen that the symptoms have not improved after the first FMT or the second FMT, every second week it was done. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Dr. Piyush? Uh, Samarth, uh, what are the other recommended uh, indications for FMT and what else it is being tried for? Sir, FMT, if we talk about the in the gastroenterology, the C. difficile is the only FDA approved indication. In the hepatology, nowadays it has been in the alcoholic hepatitis. It is one of the primary indication for FMT. Apart from it, in the ACLF also, few people have tried. In the ulcerative colitis, there are four landmark trials that have uh, proven its role. While from in the India, from DMC Ludhiana group, there had been two trials for the maintenance as well as for the remission, they have proven its role for both. Uh, or the, while in the FMT for Crohn's disease, there are three, four studies. One of them had proven its effect. And coming on to the irritable bowel syndrome, there are two much discussed studies. One shows the positive effect, one shows the negative effect. Apart from the gastrointestinal and hepatology causes, FMT has been shown to, as an anti-obesity treatment while and for the Parkinson's as well. I think uh, since we have no more questions, very two good presentation from both the students. Uh, final word from Dr. Ashish and Dr. Piyush before we close down. Dr. Piyush. So the first case presentation, which Ashok did, the things which Dr. Goenka pointed out that you should be broader in your differential diagnosis, include more things and keep at least at the end of the history, keep your options open. And as a general, this thing in any patient with ulcerative colitis, you should, with acute flare, you should be op open to this idea of investigating for precipitation by infective etiology. C. difficile is an important factor here, and that should be actively looked for. And CMV, these two things, CMV and C. difficile, should be actively looked for. Ashish, could you? Yeah, I think uh, both these students have covered well. I just want to add that while uh, writing in the exams to try to quote more of Indian studies as well, because Indian data is must and the microbiome diversity may might be different from Western countries to Indian countries, India. And so whether it would be as effective in India, we are not sure. So we will have to quote Indian studies also. Exactly. Right.
Okay, I think um, I would uh, I would appreciate both the presentations in a very high class, and I must thank uh, the Gangaram team for taking us to this class. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Singh. We are back with you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ash.